All right. Um, so thank you so much to all of us um, joining us today for our West Virginia Folklife Apprenticeship Showcase in Sheep to Shawl, the Art of Raising Sheep and Creating Fiber Arts. Uh, my name is Emily Hilliard, and, and I'm the West Virginia State Folklorist and direct the West Virginia Folklife Program at the West Virginia Humanities Council in Charleston. Um, we are supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts um, Folk and Traditional Arts Program, which supports state folklife programs across the country. Um, and the NEA also supports this apprenticeship program in part. The West Virginia Folklife Program works to document, present, sustain, and support West Virginia's uh, cultural heritage and living traditions. Um, and you can find more about our work on our blog at wvfolklife.org and our related social media sites uh, at wvfolklife. So we're here this afternoon to celebrate participants in the second year of our West Virginia Folklife Apprenticeship Program. Um, and that program offers a stipend to West Virginia traditional artists or tradition bearers working with qualified apprentices on a year long in depth apprenticeship in their cultural expression or traditional art form. And they are intended to facilitate the transmission of techniques and artistry of the forms as well as their history of, and traditions. So in 2020 to 2021, which as everyone knows was a very unusual year, um, we supported seven apprenticeship pairs and those apprenticeships started in March, um, March 1st, right before we knew it would be an unusual year. Um, and those seven pairs are um, in agroforestry slash forest farming with Ed Daniels of Mill Creek and Clara Hazlett of Wellsburg, um, Old Time Fiddle with Joe Herman of Hampshire County and Dakota Carper of Cape and Bridge, Old Time Banjo of Central West Virginia with Kim Johnson and Cody Jordan, um, both of Kanawha County. Um, Home Birth Midwifery with Angelita Nixon of Putnam County and Christine Weirich of Fayetteville. Um, a Sade Saving and Storytelling Apprenticeship with Mehmet Oztan of Reedsville and Lafayette Dexter of Fayetteville. Um, and a traditional Appalachian Herbalism Apprenticeship with Lini Hobby of Hampshire County and John Falcon of Hardy County. And we just had uh, our showcase with them last week and you can watch the recording on the West Virginia Folklife YouTube channel if you're interested. And then the team here today um, in Sheep to Shawl, the art of raising sheep and creating fiber arts with Kathy Evans of Brewston Mills and Margaret Bruning of Elkins who hopefully will be joining us shortly. Um, so Kathy Evans of Brewston Mills is a fifth generation farmer and owner of Evans Knob Farm in Preston County, where she cultivates certified naturally grown vegetables and raises sheep and poultry. She teaches and exhibits her fiber arts both in West Virginia and across the country and has been featured in Modern Farmer and Morgantown Magazine. Margaret Bruning of Elkins grew up on a goat farm in upstate New York and has been a lifelong fiber artist. She and her husband David raised sheep at their homestead in Randolph County. Um, so as we uh, got into the pandemic and it obviously became un, uh, you know, unsafe for apprenticeship pairs to gather in person, um, many of them are, well, all of them <laughs> adapted um, so they could safely continue their work. Um, and some particularly those that have seasonal um, related topics like seed saving and forest farming have prolonged their year of study. So they're, they're still in progress. Um, and though the concept of the apprenticeship program really is face-to-face, knee-to-knee -face, uh, -knee interaction, it was really incredible to witness how all of the pairs um, adapted and persevered to make their apprenticeships viable, whether that was through virtual meetings and phone calls, um, masked and socially distant meetings, um, some sent materials through the mail. I was told the ginseng team um, was FaceTiming as Clara was finding um, you know, spots in her forest that would be suitable to plant ginseng. Um, so everyone was really um, adaptable and um, found a lot of ways to still continue that to kind of simulate the face-to-face -face study. Um, so in this presentation, we will screen a 26 minute video that uh, Margaret uh, produced about her year of study with Kathy. 
Um, and then they will share some samples of their work and then we'll have a Q&A. And I have some questions, but I will also take uh, questions from the audience. Um, let me just check to see if Margaret has um, texted. Okay, she said it should just be a few minutes. Um, before we roll the video, Kathy, is there anything you'd like to say um, before we do that? Um, yeah, I guess just real briefly that it was an honor to have been selected for this apprenticeship program, but it was really special to be able to share the years of hard work and hard aches with Margaret and hopefully help her um, learn from some of the mistakes that I made and um, she'll have it a little easier than I did. <laughs> that she was great to work with and, and I would do it again in a heartbeat. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I was um, glad I was able to, to visit and take photos um, in a mask <laughs> <laughs> earlier this year. Um, yeah. But it was really great to see you two work together and uh, the studio, your beautiful studio space. Thank you. And cute dogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I will screen the video and hopefully in the meantime, um, Margaret will be able to join us. Um, let me just get a screen sharing going here. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, Is that working? Yeah. Advisement. There is no shawl at the end of this apprenticeship, and no shawl in this video. The Sheep to Shawl Apprenticeship, doing right by your sheep, improving fiber processing skills, and taking the next step as a novice weaver. The COVID pandemic introduced an unexpected time and space to be more isolated than usual, living on a mountainside in rural West Virginia. Like many across the nation, there was uncertainty, rethinking of priorities and figuring out how to earn an income, stay safe, and be responsible. Being isolated in this new way, we called social distancing and sheltering in place. Staying at home for this apprenticeship meant reaching out to others in new ways on the internet, placing a breathless phone call on the mountain, in the muck, being coached by her mentor about how to save an animal's life, struggling alone at the loom with a process that was meant to have been done under the keen eye of fellow weavers, instead doing and undoing and redoing. But like countless other folk life craftsmen and women, what came next was the struggle not just to survive, but to thrive, to overcome insecurities, 
meet the challenges at hand, and to produce beautiful and necessary work. The Sheep to Shawl Folk Life Apprenticeship. A year round intensive. Lambing, tending, shearing, processing. Not steps, but a cycle. On West Virginia's rolling hills and forest, Winter's late departure will soon enough give way. Mish, mish, come out and say. And now, with the arrival of spring, among the many realities this apprentice will learn is that we just can't keep them all. All the lambs, that is. Watch for the things we can learn from a mother you. The unbearable cuteness of lambs. What are you doing, my little guy? What are you doing on my little guys? It's a nice brisk breeze we have going on, isn't it? Yeah. As you grain your sheep and while you weep, we are your sisters. We stand strong upon your craggy hillside farm. Caress you while you sleep, we are your sisters. Never wonder where we are, we are not far. We've come to share your work, nestle seedlings in the dirt, cause we're your sisters. We've come to From feed black to your gray, ducks, lambs growing up and muck. eating all kinds we of things. Everybody. And when your sheep dog calls in the middle of the night, newborning lamb can't breathe, mother groans and heaves. Under the great we old apple tree, a variable forage, more mouths to feed, more food, more water, more planning on where to move their pasture the next. Sprigged with hay. We are lying in the meadow, on sheep bellies rest our head, oh we're your sisters, playing on, oh, singing on, and laughing on. We are your sisters. As you grain your sheep and while you weep, we are your The farmer sisters. knows no matter what you do to try to help, sometimes a sheep is just bound to die. Rest you while you sleep. We are your Look for the signs. We're here, your sister. The lessons we learn from our animals sometimes come at their expense. Compass Birds by Daniel Summers. What is the cost of West Virginia starlight? A short lament of oak wood memories, sisters huddled like Appalachian mystics, reading their future in ashwood skies. My sisters are the answer to where birds go at night, to sing, to hunt, to call, 
as sentinels from midnight totems, branches stretched toward star charts. If you know a woman who can guide like that from childhood to transitions, then call her sister, like song larks call in the hollers by the farm hills and lovely preserved orchards. When tomorrow comes, we will be weathered and lovely, sisters and mighty, cloaked as midnight stars of country groves wrestling with sing-song, I love you and you and each of you. My mentor says, when you lose the feeling, if the sheep become a material thing, then your heart is not connected and your animals will suffer. We can't keep them all. That's why I sit with this one. Oh my, that's why I sit with this one.
Do not take for granted a beautiful fleece. New skills in shearing, thanks to my mentor's unique method. She trusted me to shear her sheep, and now I trust myself to shear mine. The art of shearing is truly a trade to refine. An appreciation for the water flowing from this green mountain. What one craftsman, farmer, fibers artist will do may not be the right thing for another. Washing fleece, memories from my youth, washing wool together. My daily life is inhabited by sheep. My heart wonders what would mom do? A creative exercise, weaving in the woods. Natural dyeing, to dye wool with onion skins and such. Creating color, changing color, adding color. Frustrating, intriguing, dynamic. Experimenting within parameters. So confusing, exciting, delicious, addictive. Lovely, so lovely, color. What does the fiber really want? Sometimes less is more. No color added can be the most beautiful of all. And then, there's more. More steps, more wool, more. I reflect, I can see now her imprint in mine. Finally, experimenting with this wool grown on the backs of animals across this mountain. My mentor, many mentors, inspire me, know they challenge me. Be my own creative expert. Dive in. It's a spinner's coming of age. It was made and still is made. With my mentor in my ear, yet missing this year those seasoned weavers at their looms in the studio, rhythmic squeaks and creaks and chatter. Doing and undoing, this is my time alone in the studio. Looking for clues, thinking about how mom would have solved a problem at the loom. Oh. 
I am impatient. I attempt to tap into the collective resilience of those who came before. I met someone on a Facebook group recently. Jennifer, she had shared a natural dying chart of her mother made in the 1970s. We wrote to each other and realized we're in similar situations. Her mom had passed away and she inherited all of her mom's things, spinning wheel, loom, yarn, you name it. Our friend, our mother, our grandmother, our neighbor. When they leave us, they leave the tools of their creative pursuits. I think the best way to become a fiber artist is to inherit a crazy passion from someone we love. If we accept their challenge, we then pick up the pieces and continue the flow of the tradition from her hand through ours. This project on my tabletop loom is called simply Two Weavers Red and Green Project. You see, I'm a beginning weaver here finishing the work of another weaver who I will never meet. I'm humbled by the experience of learning a bit of the rhythms and techniques commenced by this unknown artist's work. I realize that finishing the project of another is an act that honors their passions, their handiwork, and them, and that I play my part in passing the torch of a long-lasting cultural tradition that predates me, our inheritance, and their legacy. Working mantras of the sheep to shawl apprentice. We learn our craft together, and we learn our craft alone, face to face, with the thing fueling us in the moment. The novice summons the calm and confidence she saw in her mentor. Every decision she makes was made with their hand on her shoulder. Time and experience helped cultivate a keen eye and amass knowledge. Because of this year-long inauguration, like the seasoned shepherd and the master weaver alike, who both rose from somewhere, the apprentice has begun to develop a keen eye and useful sensitivity to her craft. Time for rumination. The apprentice begins to find her own calm that comes from having seen enough and fixed enough. And now, a lifetime to refine the humility, creativity, resilience, perseverance. This folk life apprenticeship doesn't end. There are only cycles of time, something to behold, someone to admire every step of the way. There is no shawl yet, but this is sheep to shawl. This is a way of life.
Okay, hold on. The video is still still playing on my screen. Okay. Um, so Margaret, we can't. Oh, I think she's. Okay, Margaret, if you turn on your camera, I think we'll be able to see you. Okay, maybe maybe we won't be able to see Margaret. Um, but <laughs> yeah, a really lovely video that Margaret put together. Um, and I know that Margaret and Kathy have some uh, samples to share. So Kathy, um, or maybe that was Margaret. Uh, I think Margaret. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Wi-Fi wi is not working out. That's so sad. Um, well, I'm glad you could be here at least to listen in. Um, and if you, oh, there she is. <laughs> Margaret, if you unmute, we should be able to hear you. Wahoo. Oh, great. <laughs> My apologies. No um, so glad you could make it. Um, someone has asked for the video link, which I will share. Um, I just need to find it. Um, so Margaret, do you have some, looks like you have some samples with you. Would you like to uh, talk about those and share them? I do. I, I'll start with the most exciting one. Sure. Um, well, I have been working with a very unusual fleece. And being that I was a, not a, um, a beginner spinner, I could process the wool and really sort of experiment with it. And Kathy really helped me with that. And Kathy taught me a technique on how to ply with what's called thread plying. And I've been really experimenting with th thread plying. Um, and I don't know if you can see this, I thread plied gray wool with an orange, um, uh, kind of a, probably a cotton of some kind. But I also ended up weaving the gray wool into my weaving. <laughs> and it is not a is not finished and is not a shawl. <laughs> what I ended up making, I think, is a table runner slash sampler slash learning really how weaving behaves. Um, and I'm really excited to continue exploring what to do what to do and how to um, handle the Romanoff wool because it's very different from other wool. Um, it's beautiful. And do you want to show the zine as well? Sure. Well, I brought with me um, a copy of Emily Prentice's zine. And this is a, an artist designed book. And it's meant to convey some content from my journal. And um, this is a companion piece to the video. There we go. <laughs> um, and it's beautifully illustrated by Emily. She's an Elkins artist. And what did it is took photos of um, plants and that I took that into the actual content of this book. So she's got her illustrations and some of my photos. And this is available online. And what we wanted to do is um, make this book accessible on a different level than a video. We also wanted to create kind of a permanent, you know, tangible keepsake. Um, and a zine is a really great way to convey in a low key, very approachable way, content that might not otherwise be something that the rest of us would ever come across. A lot of times zines are very um, opinion oriented and maybe even political, but they're really almost, you can use it as a manifesto of sorts. And that's what I did, taking the, both the learnings and the vulnerability of what I got 
from this um, apprenticeship and put it into a way that's lovely and digestible and approachable. And I also brought copies of the photo book if you want to see that. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. And here's the cover. Uh, this is called Positive Ruminations. And I think maybe I, I know I'm, I reflected in the film and also in the, in the zine, but I reflect in here about my mom's passing and my mom's legacy as, um, as the first woman I ever knew. So I also reflect in this material about the qualities I see in Kathy as a mentor, an artist, a farmer, and as a woman. And so positive ruminations is meant to be a play on words. The rumination, the ruminating that a sheep does when they're chewing their cud, that's called, they're called ruminants, but also ruminating about, you know, where I come from and the women who influence me. And also the hard knocks and learnings and awarenesses, I call them breathy awarenesses that happen throughout this apprenticeship. And so, and here I meant for this book to actually be kind of a nice record for the Humanities Council about, um, about a folk life apprenticeship. And all this material I hope becomes a great record about folk life and an apprenticeship. You know, be being willing to be an apprentice means you're willing to be um, vulnerable and real and open with your mentor, but also your, your craft and the things that it has to show you and its time and tempo. Um, you know, what happens during which season for the sheep, for example. And on my hillside, it might be very different for, from someone else. But across the board, as an apprentice, you know, we have to be willing to get our hands dirty and jump in as if we possess the confidence that our mentor possesses. And, and I say somewhere in these materials that hopefully, you know, I remember some of the things I learned from anybody who mentored me, especially my mentor and Kathy, for example. Um, and then I'm willing to just do it. And my confidence, and I think of her calm and decision-making every time I have to make my own decisions. And Kathy taught me to just pick up the wool <laughs> and be willing to experiment with it because I, I realized I was um, procrastinating. And I wanted this book to be beautiful because most, important, most importantly, this was a beautiful experience. And um, I think that uh, that's part of what folk life is about. It's about the practical matters, making something useful, but also something meaningful and to me. Um, beautiful as well. And I just remembered, I have another sample with me that I wanted to show you. Because I'm really bummed that we are doing this on the computer and my apologies for my compute, complete um, lack of computer savvy. <laughs> but I have in this jar, <laughs> I have in this jar, this lovely sample of raw wool that I was really hoping everybody could get a, a, a touch of it. Which way do I go? Like this, no, this way. I was really hoping to be able to convey and to show how lofty and soft and fluffy this is. And when you smell it, it smells like a sheep. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this, <laughs> this is wool. This is what's called lamb's wool. When you shear a lamb, a young animal, they have such soft wool. It's the coveted wool. And this is from Lil G. And Lil G in the video, he's now called Vasily. And I decided to keep him. He's a weather and weathers often have the most beautiful um, wool. And so I'm, I kept him for his wool, but also because I became attached. <laughs> so I hope at some point in the future, you know, anyone watching this feels like, oh, I should go and find myself some raw wool. Where do I find it? Well, there are a lot of places to find it, starting with a sheep you see along the roadway in West Virginia. <laughs> um, Anytime, this will live back in here. 
And so the zine and photo book, the zine is available um, for purchase. And I put a link in the chat um, where you can access that. And um, then the photo book and the zine will also be part of the archive <clears throat> of the Folk Life program. And we'll also have a copy at our um, offices that will go with us to um, exhibits and um, demonstrations and things like that. We're also working to get them in public libraries um, in the local areas where Margaret and Kathy live. And hopefully the zine library at, at WVU as well. Um, so I have a few questions. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice a little. Uh, but then, then I'd like to get, um, uh, allow attendees to ask their own questions. So um, I know that this practice is tied to the land inherently um, in the local environment because of the fact that sheep graze on um, the grass and plants um, on the land. But I am interested to hear both of you talk about um, what ties you know, your interpretation and practice of this tradition to this particular place, uh, whether that's, you know, the place of your farm um, specifically or West Virginia or Appalachia in general, or however you kind of interpret place. Um, how does your practice of this tradition um, tie back to that and tie into that? Well, I'll, I'll go if you want. Go ahead, Margaret. Let me, I need to think about this for a moment. Okay. <laughs> well, Kathy's on a uh, fourth or fifth generation farm. Kathy, I, I'm trying fourth. to remember how many generations you and Reed are in. Fourth generation. We, we are number four. Um, yeah. And well, I, I'm, relatively new to West Virginia. And I've been here four years. <laughs> and um, a few things. One of the things that I found in doing my research for my application is that West Virginia, before beef became really big, West Virginia was a, a, a sheep um, farming place. And, um, you know, that has really kind of dropped off in recent decades and generations. Um, and there are, are now, I think there's a growing interest in lamb again, but also one of the things that I feel like connects me to that on our property is that West Virginia has a lot of small and mid-sized farms. And, you know, we have 40 acres of rolling mountainous, you know, landscape. A lot of it is untouched. And so we're definitely a small scale situation. Um, and I feel as though we are really aligned with the people who are doing what now would be called small batch, you know, but um, not necessarily large scale farmers, but people who are, do, are in a more non-traditional farm format. And, um, you know, also being newish here, I, I realize I'm not a native West Virginian and I never will be, but um, what I do have is that I've committed to West Virginia as my home. And I love my home and I live here um, on purpose. And, you know, we are among a lot of people who come to West Virginia because we love it. And I think of West Virginia as a real true melting pot. Our history is, in, is very multicultural, um, dating back, you know, to, well, um, the first pioneers who headed south before moving west to get gold, our first pioneers, Americans, came here to Virginia and West Virginia. And then um, immigrants came to work for the mines and immigrants from all over the world were coming from Staten Island um, and, and coming through West Virginia and making their home here as well. And we're a real true melting pot and, and continuing to evolve and change today. So um, 
I find there are a lot of people who make sheep to shawl or some aspect of shawl or sheep a part of their lives, whether or not it's actually, oh, whether or not they're actually um, a large scale farm. And what about you? And Kathy? I'm looking for a plug right now. Sorry, you guys. Okay. But Kathy, maybe you wanted to answer the question. Okay. Um, I, I look at it as, um, well, I've told people that, that farming is not a career. It's not an occupation. It's a way of life and it's in your soul. Um, and I come from a long line of farmers. Um, and so does my husband Reed, um, back generations as far as we can remember. Everybody has been a farmer, um, maybe not totally making their full living off of the farm, but always being a part of the farm. Um, sheep were something brand new to me. I had never had much experience with it. Um, when Reed was a child, he had, uh, his parents had sheep on, on this farm. Um, but for me, it's keeping the tradition alive. Um, and it's part stubbornness and part love um, to make sure that this art doesn't die out and that those of us that have been blessed to be a part of this, share it with others. Um, and this farm is as much a part of me as I am of it. And um, I've told my kids that when I die, I want my ashes sprinkled on the farm so I can really be a part of the farm. Um, that's being debated at this moment, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's where I'm at. You know, it's just part of tradition and keeping an art form alive. Um, yeah, that's really... Um... That's well, I think that's reflected in the way you conceived of this apprenticeship as this very holistic um, sheep to shawl. It's not just um, you know weaving, but it's um, it's the full process. It's um, mm -hmm. having a relationship with your animals and the land, and um, then making use of what they provide, and then turning that into something artful. But you know, the, there's creative aspects to all of it, which I think is really reflected in the video. Um, so we have about seven minutes left. Um, and I wanted to open it up to questions from the audience. So you can put that in a Q&A &A or in the chat and I'll just read them. Um, and we can have uh, Margaret and Kathy answer. No questions. Um, I'll I'll ask one maybe while people are waiting. But I'm interested in. Um, oh, uh, I'll start. <laughs> we have one more. Um, I'm interested in uh, where you see the future of this tradition going, and um, what uh, what your hopes are for the future, and what needs to be in place to see that future realized, um, and specifically in West Virginia. Yes. I'm, I'm, well, I can answer. Okay, go ahead, Margaret. Oh, I was just going to say, um, there is a movement afoot to create a West Virginia fiber shed. And um, I think that is a very important consortium um, that could serve in a lot of capacities, both with um, new and emerging fiber artists, um, people with sheep and um, producers, and also agritourism, um, anytime a, a, a collective really forms around a subject that we're passionate in, that's not just commerce related, but also culture related, we can actually create a stronger um, a, a affiliation and leverage all of our assets, especially when it comes to audience and marketing and um, the idea of something being truly West Virginian. 
And I think we have a, an incredible opportunity here to continue the, these traditions that I think people are assume are for maybe perhaps a different generation or older generation, but just as younger people are interested in food and, and food preservation and growing their food and slow food, I think um, there is also huge interest in uh, handiwork and craftsmanship and this idea of kind of going back to simpler um, things. Well, maybe an honest day's work is the phrase for it when, when it comes to weaving and fiber arts. It's not simpler, but it's definitely an honest hard work when you're trying to create something with your hands. <laughs> Patrick asks if you could define fiber shed. Um, I don't know if I know the technical definition of fiber shed, but think of it as a, a regional um, concept that links together um, all aspects of the fiber arts, whether it's people raising sheep. Um, so think of it as, yeah, like a consortium um, to people who are looking for fiber because they are spinners or knitters or weavers. Um, and then also um, leveraging this as an arts and cultural asset um, in terms of marketing and, and tourism and agritourism. Um, I recently went on a, there's a fiber shed tour in upstate New York in the Hudson Valley area. So you go from farm to farm visiting and seeing how they do it. And there's a whole weekend tour, just like there might be, you know, um, uh, a cheese farm tour. Well, these are, you know, um, fiber farm tours and places where you can see how wool is um, processed and spun. And so a fiber shed really is just an overarching concept. Kathy, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think I think Margaret hit it right on the head. It's just a, a group of people that are working together to promote a certain um, a, a certain aspect of, of agriculture. It's like a the food shed. Um, it's like a watershed. It's just a regional thing where the focus is on one particular aspect. And and she's talking about fiber, and that could not only include sheep, but it could also include alpaca and um, it could angora rabbits, cashmere goats, you know, anybody that's producing some type of fiber that you can, you can spin or weave or knit or, you know, do something with. Um, so Lini Javi asked- you No, know, to add oh, on to that real quick. Oh. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say the West Virginia Department of Agriculture has done in the past a survey of fiber producers or no, sorry, sheep, sheep farms. And they've included in there the question about fibers. Um, it's been some time since they've produced that um, report, that survey. And um, most recently I said, hey, what about doing that again? <laughs> so um you know, there, there are no plans to reproduce that survey. It's kind of like a census, a statewide census, but I think it would be really wise to do to see who's doing what, not just raising sheep, but what fibers are we creating and what are we producing that then could become a West Virginia um, um, product or something that could be marketed, uh, especially outside of West Virginia or for people coming to West Virginia, but also marketed to us as West Virginians. Right. Um. So Lini says, um, I'm so thankful that you are sharing this tradition. I know there was a lot of reference to the artistic aspects of weaving, but I wonder too how you feel allowing us to have a behind the scenes look at raising sheep and making cloth might help those of us living in the era of fast fashion might gain greater insight into the work and value of this work. True. Um, Elizabeth Slavensky asks, can you speak a little more to different breeds that might be suited to West Virginia's changing climate? Uh, 
That's a very good question. I don't, I'm not experienced enough to answer. Um, and that's something I uh, am very keen on exploring because certain fiber breeds are really, they have a hard time in our hot, wet, humid climate in our summers. Um, so I, that's something I'm definitely interested in learning more about. That, you know, it is a concern, um, especially in the wet, the hot, humid, wet years. Um, you've got parasite pressure. You have to watch for fly strike on your longer wool breeds. Um, I think a lot of it is just being a good shepherd, um, having your eyes and your hands on your sheep almost every day and seeing what they're doing and how they're reacting. And um, I don't know that there are any specific breeds that are best suited to West Virginia. I think a lot of it is in the eye of the shepherd, just being willing to be out there and, and paying attention to your sheep. They'll tell you when they're in trouble. Right, Margaret? Oh yeah, well, I'm just smiling because uh... I have noticed with the Romanovs that they are, they're very good foragers and they're also really lanky athletic animals. Um, but any sheep with a fleece on them will get tangled in the briar, in the thicket. And that's something I'm always watching out for. Um, and they out pace our white sheep <laughs> who may not be as tall or limber or athletic they might be a little bit rounder in the belly and not not as swift moving one cool thing i've noticed about the romanovs is some people call them flighty but they're really really alert especially to potential predators and when something alerts them they all move and mass and they're prepared to also chase away something I've seen them chase away our dog when we when they first got to know our dog. And to me, those are really good qualities to have because not all of us are going to have a guard animal um, or, a, you know, or we have predators that we need to be aware of, too. So I think you're right, Kathy, you know, just um, paying attention to your sheep is always very and to this commit, you know, the, the Romanovs are a Russian breed, but they um, seem, and so they're really well suited to a cold climate, but they seem to do really well so far in this particular climate too. And I haven't had any issues of fleece rot um, that I've seen in my other sheep. Um, yeah, so Ellen Bowman asked, how is Romanov wool different from other wool? Roma dual fleeced animal, back guard hairs, and also um, long, fine gray wool. And so um, it's really an excellent wool um, for tapestries and um, weaving. It's getting more known among hand spinners as a novelty yarn, um, but it's extremely soft and at the Time, the black guard hairs are very coarse. So I'd say it's a, a more of a novelty wool to work with, um, definitely a refined wool. And I never pretended like I was going to extract out all the black guard hairs. A lot of people will separate the guard hair from the wool. There's a lot of guard hair and I decided just to embrace it and incorporate it into my projects and my process. And means I have to be more careful and keep it separate from my other wool because the black guard hair will get everywhere. <laughs> um, well, uh, do either of you, I know we didn't quite get to all the questions, but we should let, let everyone go because um, we're a little over time already, but uh, do either of you have anything you would like to add um, as we wrap up? I just want to say I lived here and are especially our indigenous populations that were here. And in the sheep to Shawzine, 
we acknowledge and um, recognize that we've created this in present day West Virginia on land, land known by the Osage, Omaha, Shawnee, Delaware, and Seneca as a home place and meeting space. And we acknowledge and thank all those who are here first. And I say in my little book, the same thing, this place is not mine. It belongs to the people who are here before me and those who come after and likewise my folk life endeavors um, were born not just with me but with the people who came before me and instilled that in me and I hope that I can instill this in others as well as as um, something that we can value and um, be proud of. Great it's a good good thought to end on um, thinking of the past and the future. Um, Kathy is there anything else? Like if you think you might be interested in learning about um, learning about sheep, learning about wool, spinning, whatever. Um, there are a lot of us that are willing to teach and because we want very desperately for this, this tradition, this um, art to continue, look somebody up and ask. And um, it's not gonna cost you a million dollars to learn how to do it. And it's something that you'll carry with you for a lifetime. Great. Um, so we will put a recording of this up on our um, website. There's also a, uh, well, it's, it will be on our YouTube. Um, you can also find a, an apprenticeship feature um, on Kathy and Margaret at wvfolklife.org. And they both have their own Instagram and website um, that I encourage you to check out. And uh, also make sure to look for the zine and the, um, the photo book as well. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And thank you, uh, Kathy and Margaret. And congratulations on a really hard year of work, um, but it seemed to be very productive and uh, successful. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. All right, take care. Bye-bye.